it just feels like there's a, a moment right now where a lot of the kind of conventional wisdom about what is possible and impossible to do with technology has 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 gone by the wayside, and we're just kind of discovering this this new world. and And what a fascinating time to be covering not just AI but but tech in general as it touches so many other things. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm your host, Kevin Scott, Chief Technology Officer for Microsoft. In this podcast, we're going to get behind the tech. We'll talk with some of the people who have made our modern tech world possible and understand what motivated them to create what they did. So join me to maybe learn a little bit about the history of computing and get a few behind the scenes insights into what's happening today. Stick around. Hello and welcome to Behind the Tech. I'm Senior Developer Advocate at GitHub, Christina Warren. And I'm Kevin Scott. And today we have a really exciting guest joining us, uh, another Kevin, Kevin Roos. He is a technology columnist and podcast host for The New York Times, where he covers all kinds of stuff about technology, including automation, AI, cybersecurity, digital wellness. But where you may know him from most recently is that he was the journalist who wrote like one of the most talked about columns honestly, in years, um, where he wrote about his surprising conversation with uh, the Bing bot, a.k.a. Sydney. Uh, he's also a former colleague of mine. I'm super excited that you're going to get to talk with him. Kevin, can you share a little bit more about like why you wanted to bring Kevin Roos on, you know, Sydney's paramour? Kevin is one of the most thoughtful journalists working right now covering AI. And it, we're at a point in time where I think journalists covering AI is like especially important. Like we have this technology that is um, one way or the other going to have really substantial impacts on society. And I think it's super important for the public to be well informed about uh, what is going on with the technology, where it's headed and you know, giving people some tools to think about how to you know frame their own opinions about AI. That uh, article that Kevin published uh, about Sydney, uh, I think is actually the most read article in New York Times history. I've heard that now from a couple of people at the New York wow. Times, which is kind of incredible. Um, and I think he did a really, uh, a really great job uh, publishing the full details of the transcript of the conversation that he had. And so, you know, like, I think that's actually really super solid uh, reporting. And plus, you know, I've had a few interactions with him, uh, like around that article. And uh, before that, I had been on his podcast. And like, I just I find him super thoughtful and interesting. So I was really excited that he uh, agreed to be on my podcast. No, I'm super excited too. And uh, let's go ahead and give that conversation with Kevin a listen. Kevin Roos is a technology columnist for the New York Times, where he covers the tech that influences our lives, culture, and society. In addition to being a reporter, he's the best selling author of three books Future Proof, Young Money, and The Unlikely Disciple. He's written about everything from automation and AI to the semester he spent undercover as a student at Liberty University. His most recent book, Future Proof, is a guide to surviving the technological future and includes nine rules to help people feel more confident about being happy in a machine-filled world. In addition to his writing, Kevin co-hosts the Times weekly tech podcast, Hard Fork. Kevin, I am so glad to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for having me. Two Kevins on one podcast. Is that even legal? Yeah, I don't know. It's a, uh, you know, sort of a weird thing, right? <laughs> um, so we always start these conversations by going all the way back to childhood. And uh, like you obviously are doing a very important and interesting job now. And so I just sort of love to understand better, like how you got interested in either journalists or the technology world that you uh, cover. Like, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started. Yeah, so I grew up in a small town in Ohio, and uh, I was uh, obsessed with computers from a very early age. This was in the the '90s, and I remember using my my parents, uh, you know, dial up modem to to get onto AOL so that I could look stuff up or talk to my friends or play chess online. And uh, my first job, I was actually um, about maybe 10 or 11, I started building websites with my brother for like the local businesses in our town. And, um, and really just 
sort of embraced the internet kind of as a as a way to escape my my small town um and i i i know a lot of people have had that experience where the internet sort of becomes this this refuge or this place where things are a lot more fun and interesting there's a lot more going on than maybe the the, the place where you physically live so i was uh, i was always on the internet i was always uh in you know irc chat rooms and on AOL instant messenger and um you know uh, pirating software, <laughs> including some Microsoft software. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, and just you know spent all all the time that I could on the internet. And so I when I started getting into journalism as a college student, um, you know, tech was always something that really interested me. And um, I had this very bizarre kind of backward career trajectory where I, I wrote a book while I was in college, which is the book you mentioned about um, going uh, undercover at. Uh, very conservative Christian school in Lynchburg, Virginia called Liberty University. Um, that experience was sort of my introduction to journalism and had nothing to do with tech. Um, but then sort of gradually over the next few years after college, I sort of worked my way back to, to covering tech, which is what I've been doing for like the last decade. Yeah, there, there are a couple of things there that I'd like to dig into. Um, I mean, maybe the first of which is I, Oftentimes in these conversations that I have with uh, with folks and like I, I suspect I'm about 10 years older than you are, but I had a similar experience uh, with computers when I was young. And I just sort of wonder and I don't know whether you have a take on this, um, whether that sense of the world expanding through computers uh, from, you know, you sort of being in this place where, you know, it's a very small community. There was no modern internet uh, in the form that it's in now when I was a kid, but yeah, you know, there was still dial up and, you know, you could do IRC and whatnot. And, and so like that moment that you connect to this larger community is like really thrilling and empowering. And I, I wonder I mean, you, you must have some of that today, but like it's also a very different experience because everybody just sort of inherits connection from scratch now. Yeah, well, now everyone's as online as as we were back in the '90s. I mean, there there still are pockets of the internet that feel like that kind of old uh, internet of of the '90s, but you know, it's vastly different. You know, everyone's spending all their time on the internet now, so it's not as novel. Um, and and there's something. You know, there was something really liberating about that. You know, I could, as a you know, eleven year old kid, be you know talking about things on message boards or designing websites for businesses who had no idea that I was eleven and in a yeah. small town in Ohio. Um, I was just you know whatever my my screen name or my my uh, user handle was, and there was something kind of you know now we talk about kind of the the anonymous parts of the internet or the pseudonymous parts of the internet as being dark and dangerous and there's there's sort of a risk associated with that don't you want to know who you're talking to uh, but as someone who spent a lot of time on the other side of that is like you know a kid who was per, you know not pretending to be someone else but just who was sort of obscuring that part of his identity and and getting away with it like that was kind of thrilling for me so yeah. I, I i do miss that part of it well, there was also this interesting thing, too, that there was a high barrier to entry of getting on the Internet. And so, you know, if you pass that barrier, like you were able to sort out all of the complexity to get on. Uh, once you got there, there were just a whole bunch of people like you. And so it, it honestly didn't matter that you were 11. You were clever enough to, like, uh, find your way into these forums. And that, that was the entry price, right? Yeah, and and there was something cool about that. It felt like being led into a secret club, or you know, having uh, a, a type of skill that meant that you could do things that your friends couldn't do at school. Um, but yeah, it was. I mean, it was just so much fun, and um, and I just I, I would have lived there all the time if I could have. If I didn't have to, like you know, put on pants and go to school, um, I probably would have just sat there on the internet all day. <laughs> and were your parents uh, technical at all? N not so much. I'm, my my dad was a lawyer. My mom was a college administrator. But my my dad was really the the sort of most tech person in in the family. You know, he was the guy who would like you know go out and buy the the K Pro. You know, when it was new, and he you know he would 
he would just like he was just a hobbyist but um but he was into tech and so um you know we always had sort of not the newest computer like it was it was never like the fanciest or newest one but you know we had broadband internet before a lot of people i knew um you know we we had uh we we always sort of had a computer that was no more than a few years old so i i was lucky in that respect that i got to play around with um with that and then the the best you know moment of of my childhood maybe not the best moment one of the formative moments was when i i got to actually move the 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 old family computer when we got a new one the new one came into my room and so that was like okay now my screen time has gone from like four or five hours a day to like way more than that because now i can stay (laughs) up late at night i don't have to go to sleep and i can just be playing space invaders all night uh, that's awesome. So uh, let's let's talk uh, talk about your tech chop. So what were your tools of choice when you were building these uh, these websites? I started doing it. Uh, it sounds like I'm flexing or bragging. I started doing it by hand in a text editor in HTML. Um, I, I then went to some you know tools like I remember using Dreamweaver um, for a while. These sort of like early WYSIWYG. Um, you know, HTML, CSS editors. Um, I did a little bit of Flash, a little bit of Java, but mostly, mostly, um, you know, HTML and CSS. Nice. And what was your favorite uh, text editor? This is a very important thing for programmers. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, what did I even use? I mean, it might have just been like the default Windows one because I probably I- thought that was very cool. Yeah, dude, Notepad is legit. Uh, like we we have a lot of people who really, really, really Some great love. Software has been built in Notepad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So I I want to talk about like you 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 had this experience with computers when you were young, and it sounds like you didn't get inspired to uh, like invest your life in journalism until you were in college. Like, how did you get interested in that? Well, I was interested in journalism. I mean, I loved to read as a kid. That was my other big hobby is I just I just read all the time and I really loved these kind of like magazine style reported pieces that were, you know, creative and interesting. What they what they now call like new journalism, although mm-hmm. even though it's like, you know, 70 years old at this point. Um, but it was it was you know, I, I love Tom Wolfe and Gay Talese and and Joan Didion and these writers who just would go out and report, but also just had so much personality and and that really shone through. And so during my freshman year of college, um, I decided that I wanted to get a, a writing internship just to see what I could learn and, and if that was something. So I applied to like 20 magazines in New York, um, hoping that one of them would take me on and all of them rejected me. <laughs> and because um, I was 18 and what did I know about writing and what skills did I have to offer? And then I, I sort of took a flyer. I, I wrote a, a fan letter essentially to this writer named AJ Jacobs, who I really mm-hmm. um, admired. And uh, he was sort of um, like an experiential journalist. He would go do things, do, you know, he would read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica and then write a book about it. Or right. you know, he, he did a book where he followed all the rules in the Bible for a year um, and then wrote a book about that. And so I, I had read one of his books, really liked it, wrote him a letter, said, could I come work for you for the summer? And he wrote back, much to my surprise, and said, sure. So he was sort of my my first mentor, my first experience with a professional journalist. And through that internship, that's how I ended up getting my my first book deal. Well, so the the... Next thing that I wanted to chat with you about is, um, you know, I, I sort of feel like you're covering technology, but you're also living inside of an industry where technology has had rather enormous impacts on the business uh, itself. Um, and, and it continues to sort of have impacts, like even in the last handful of years, like there, I think there's less a uh, popular conversation about it now than there was a couple of years ago, but like there was this big movement of people to Substack and like, you know, folks who are, you know, not working for uh, publishers, but like trying to, you know, build their own personal uh, publishing brand. Um, and, and you've been doing this long enough where I'm curious what your observations are about how technology itself is impacting the the news business and like what do you think that means for you know, p- people like you who are you know graduating right now and hoping to have a career in journalism and like what their future and career is going to look like. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't I don't feel like I ever really experienced the the 
the news industry before this stuff started happening. I mean, I, you know, you'll hear old timers talking about, you know, when they were filing on typewriters and, you know, fax machines and, and like, that was all before my time. Um, you know, when I got into journalism in the early aughts, um, it was already undergoing a transformation. You know, you had the, you know, the, the sort of rise of the kind of new media companies, the Buzzfeeds, the Huffington Posts, the, the Vices, the Voxes, you know, those were all sort of already underway or, or just starting up. Um, Gawker, I mean, it was a big thing when I was coming yeah. up in, in journalism. And, you know, when I went to work at the New York Times for the first time, they were still very much grappling with what is happening to not only our business, but lots of other businesses as a result of technology. I remember I was at the New York Times when uh, Facebook bought Instagram. Uh, and it was like on the front page of the newspaper. And that was sort of a big deal at the time. Maybe yep. looking back, it seems obvious. Obviously, that turned out to be like one of the biggest you know, business stories of that decade. But at the time, it was like, you're putting Instagram on the front page of the New York Times? Like, does it really yep. merit that? And I was sort of a beneficiary of the, the all of the confusion and the sort of panic and the chaos in the media industry because I was, I was young, I was techie, and I was like, I, I could sort of explain things to people who were maybe a little less native in it. And that was a, a really like successful niche for me is just like explaining what's going on on the internet. Um, but now obviously that's like everyone is writing about what's going on the internet. If you look at, you know, cable news, it's just people reading out social media posts um, and talking about what happened on the internet. So the, the internet used to be kind of this advanced warning system for what was going to show up in the news. And now I just, I feel like it's, um, you know, the news is in increasingly just covering things that have happened on the internet. So it's been, um, you know, I've, I've tried to sort of stay on on the edge. I mean, as a tech journalist, I'm always excited about the bleeding edge, the frontier, what's coming. Um, and so, you know, I've always just tried to stay there and sort of ride that and, and be curious about it. Yeah, one of the things to me uh, that seems pretty extraordinary about what's going on is there's so much more writing about the news media itself than there seems to have been in the past. So like when, when I was in grad school, um, yeah, the, the, you know, I would listen to on the media, uh, you know, on NPR, um, and you know, you, you had, uh, you know, John Stewart on Comedy Central. Like those were the two places where, you know, folks were talking about what the media itself was doing. And like there's so much now uh, of, you know, people reflecting on the state of you know, the media industry and what's going on and where it's headed and what's good and what's bad. It, it almost feels overwhelming to me and I'm not even in it. Uh, so I, I don't know what it feels like to you. <laughs> It's been challenging. I mean, there are, you know, as a, if you were a journalist working in the 90s or even earlier than that, you really didn't hear from consumers of your work all that often, right? Mm -hmm. You might get, someone might write an angry letter to the editor. Yes. Or, you know, a letter might show up in your, in your mailbox. Um, or you might get a call on the phone from someone who, you know, got the switchboard operator to connect them to your desk and had, had a, you know, I, I, I want to talk to you about a sentence in your last article that I didn't like. And now it's just, it's constant. It's a constant feedback loop from social media, from, um, you know, from frankly, like a lot of the media covering itself, and especially at the New York Times, which has the the blessing or misfortune of being um, sort of a, a you know a news beat unto itself at many other media outlets. Um, so, as a journalist, I mean, I think that accountability has sharpened my sword a little bit. Like it just it really has forced me to like be diligent and and um, you know make sure that when I'm putting something out, it is it is as correct as I can make it, um, and as fair as I can make it. Um, but it also has driven a lot of people crazy. <laughs> like, like that level of feedback in your job is, um, 
you know, I, I remember talking to someone a few years ago, and this was, I had started covering like extremists, and I was doing a lot of stories about QAnon and, and, you know, people threatening me and there was death threats. And it was, it yeah. was a really tumultuous period in my, in my professional life. And I just remember like talking with a friend outside of media. And he said, you know, if, if I have a bad day at work, like I get an angry email from my boss. Like if you have a bad day at work, you end up on Fox News. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it really just sort of, raises the overall risk of of error and the and and lowers the the sort of the margin for error um in in almost any journalism related job but especially these kind of legacy high profile ones i want to pause for a minute and talk a little bit more about that because there is this extraordinary thing here where some of the most important things for you and your colleagues and in your industry to write about are some of the most controversial things that come with the greatest volume of some of that, um, like potentially scary, um, scrutiny that is headed your way. And like every, everybody needs scrutiny, right? Like I need scrutiny, like you need it, like, but like there, there's a difference between, you know, like, Hey, here's an honest take on like the, what I see you doing. And another is like, I'm going to kill you if you don't, uh, stop doing what you're doing. And, and I just sort of wonder like how, you know, it, it, either you or your colleagues, uh, like musters up what it takes to just go do the thing that needs to be done, even in the face of all of this criticism that you may be getting. Yeah. It's, it's a good question. And, and I just want to start my answer by acknowledging that, like, I have it very easy relative to many of my colleagues and and peers. Um, some of my colleagues literally go into war zones, yeah, and dodge bullets and get taken hostage, and um, and that is a level of risk that I have never taken or never wanted to take in journalism. But I, I have a lot of respect and admiration. And and just yeah, just awe at the the colleagues of mine who do that. So we're talking about you know when we're talking about getting you know angry tweets from people like that is already uh, right. you know a, a better state of affairs than many journalists around the world work in. So also I'll add the caveat that I'm a white man and as such like I get a lot less of this and it's a lot yeah. less pointed and scary than some of my colleagues who who, who um, are not. So. Those caveats aside, I will say like this has been something that I've been thinking about and dealing with for for years now since I really started throwing myself into the the sort of bowels of internet culture um, as a reporter. You know, it's it's tough. It's tough knowing that you're going to publish something and just people are going to be unhappy with it. And you know, there are good versions of that. I mean, if you're writing about Harvey Weinstein or some you know predator somewhere and you know, you know, they're going to be pissed off, but you also know, like, that's the right story to tell. And that's, yep. you're confident. Um, that can kind of keep you going. Um, but I think people have, have, you know, people have gotten wise to the fact that, you know, reporters are people and can be influenced and swayed and harassed and intimidated and bullied and, um, and made fearful just like anyone else. And so, um, you know, I really think like that is part of the skill set of a journalist in 2023 is like, can you actually show up every day and do your job knowing that people out there are going to be some of them extremely unhappy with it? So, you know, I, I don't know that I've finished that process yet. Um, I still think a lot about, you know, people who don't like what I write and probably too much about it. But um, I will say like doing a podcast has been really healing in that respect because I think yeah. the, the feedback for I'm not sure what your experience has been but my experience has been that you know podcast listeners are so much more generous than readers um because you know they they hear your voice they have more context for the thing that you're saying they're not just seeing like a screenshot of something that you wrote that's being passed around on social media and people are dunking yeah. on it and going what an idiot this guy is um so that's been really kind of restorative yeah. for me is is having this this outlet where I feel like I can speak to an audience of people who are choosing to hear from me and and they understand me better than maybe the, the casual reader who's coming across something I wrote. Yeah, for for sure. I've had a similar experience. And it's sort of interesting. Like, I think there's a whole continuum of how people respond to things that I'm putting out in the world, depending on the medium. So the podcast is certainly different from 
uh, a social media post, uh, like a social media post is different from an essay. An essay is different from the book. Like I get, uh, like different sorts of feedback from each of them. And one of the things that I've been trying to be a lot more careful about since 2016, where I got good and properly worked up, uh, on social media over like all of the social things happening then is, yeah, I, I try to be very careful about what I consume and I try not to, I try to put less pithy stuff uh, out into the world because the, the valuable thing to me is like substantive conversation, like, like reading things that someone has thought really hard and carefully about and where, you know, they're sitting inside of a institutional process, whether it's writing peer reviewed uh, scholarly articles or whether they're a journalist at, you know, a place like the New York times or the economist where there's like a strong set of editorial, uh, guidelines and principles. But like that information to me is way better than just reading the same angry opinion over and over and over and over and over again, uh, on social media where I'm not learning anything new, uh, the 500th time I've read the same thing. Yeah, there's definitely like a, a, a value in curating your information diet, just like you would curate your, you know, your, yes. your food diet. Um, you know, a little, a little spice now and then is is nice. And so I do, I, you know, I, I do, and I, I, you know, <laughs> I like social media. I, I confess, um, at least my feeds that I've curated. But yeah, I mean, I definitely think like one thing that I have. Uh, tried really hard to to do kind of in the last few years is just reverse the kind of atrophy of my attention span yeah. and um, and really build it back up by reading longer things and um, even books sometimes I know crazy um, but uh, but yeah it's it's a constant struggle yeah but even on social media I've found that uh, what what you put out there typically gets reciprocated so mo mo that my the, the social media presence that I enjoy the most is I've got an Instagram account where all I do is post about crap that I make. Um, and the, the feedback that I get from that is overwhelmingly positive because all I'm doing is like, Hey, like I made this thing like, mm, yeah. And you don't have to react to it if you're not interested And like, nobody's on there saying, eh, hey, that sucks. Or yeah, it's just really positive. I'm I'm curious, like I I know you're asking, you're the one asking the questions on this podcast, but I'm, oh, I'm no, curious, like away. <laughs> because you know we in some ways are are inhabiting different worlds. We're like I, I kind of have to have a a social media presence, right? Like in journalism, yeah. at least in 2023, like you know it's it's really hard to move up in the world of journalism to be noticed to um, you know to get the attention of editors who might hire you or commission something from you or you know, give you a book deal or something like you, you really do have to have this sort of cultivated public persona. Whereas in tech, my, my sense is that for most people, like you can do pretty well, even if all you're using is LinkedIn yeah. or, you know, it's, it's not a sort of job requirement in the same way. So, but 100%. I'm curious because a lot of tech people still want to post, like they still, they still feel like there's social value in having you know, a Twitter account or, uh, you know, a, a, an Instagram account and, and sort of being an influencer. So I'm, I'm curious where you think that comes from. Yeah. Like, I think if you're a venture capitalist, it probably makes a lot of sense because, uh, like deal flow matters a lot. I think if you are a startup and you're recruiting heavily and like trying to, convince people to come work for you when, uh, you know, they have so many choices is probably important. Like, I think there are probably a bunch of reasons why it might be important. Um, it was more important to me, um, many years ago than it is now. Um, and it's just, um, and it's still, it's still important. Like I post regularly on both, uh, you know, Twitter, I refuse to call it the new name, uh, and, uh, <laughs> um, and, and on LinkedIn, um, I mean, like I'm, but sort you of don't biased. have to, like you, you know, yeah. you would, you know, it, so it, so, but it's always just curious to me when people who, who don't have to post still post, uh, because for a lot of journalists, I know it's like, if I didn't have to do this for my job, there's no way I would subject myself to this. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I, I really, uh, I like believe and appreciate and am sympathetic to that. So, I mean, when I post on LinkedIn, like, again, it, it is because of the, social contract on the network uh the feedback that i get from posting there tends to be almost overwhelmingly positive so it's not like i'm starting little controversies or um you know by the innocuous things that i say on linkedin um and the reason that i say them is like i've got i don't know like eight hundred thousand followers on linkedin something like that um, look at you and yeah, yeah, but you know, like, look, I, <laughs> um, you're a linked influencer, as they say. There, there's definitely a professional back and forth on LinkedIn that still makes some kind of sense to me. Um, but you know, for my personal, like the thing, like I, I actually do get joy in uh, posting things on Instagram and then you know, sort of seeing what I get back. Um, and, um, I, I just wonder in general, like how much joy people get from their use of social media. Um, it, I mean, it's definitely, there's definitely a reason people keep coming back, but you know, you could say the same about casinos. It's like, are you having fun or can you just not quit? Um, yeah. So, you know, I've tried to be really careful about, you know, segmenting off parts of my social media life that are just for fun or, you know, I, I, like I, I use TikTok, but I'm not posting uh, except yeah. for my podcast. And so, um, so that's there. There's sort of apps that are fun and apps and apps that are work apps, and I try to keep those pretty well, um, you know, cordoned off from each other. Yeah. So, like, you are writing a lot about AI, and you want to talk about a bewildering uh, world. Uh, that is, uh, that is one of them. Uh, it's, it's how you and I got connected. Uh, you know, we were. Uh, you know, we were chatting about uh, some of the AI things that Microsoft and OpenAI were doing, but you know, you've just recently published a very good podcast with uh, Dario from uh, Anthropic, uh, which you know was uh, the the result of you spending a whole bunch of time there. Uh, you know, and you, but you're you're sort of thinking about AI and people doing AI, and uh, you know, and and it's a free for all right now. <laughs> so like I, 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 love, I think it's the most interesting thing happening in the world right now yeah but i'm biased. Uh, like a, a, as do i like although i'm i'm biased so i i'd love to hear you explain why you think it's the most interesting thing in the world right now yeah i mean i've been writing and thinking about ai for for a long time um and i you know you and i both wrote books on it uh, you know mine came out a few years ago um so this is something that i've been obsessed with since i was a kid reading science fiction um but it got real, you know, it, um, I was talking with someone uh, a little while ago and I was like talking about how, you know, I'm a tech columnist. I have to be writing about lots of tech stuff. I can't just be talking about what's going on in AI and, you know, but I was sort of obsessed and I was trying to uh, tell this person, you know, why, why I was so obsessed and they, they went, you know, I get it. They taught rocks to think. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, you know, that's pretty good. That's pretty that's good. Pretty they good. taught rocks to think. Yeah. And um and like that encapsulates what is so fascinating about this moment in AI is we have these thinking rocks now. And like, what the hell are we gonna do with them? And yeah. what are they gonna do with us? And like it just it feels like a moment where all of the rules have gone out the window. Um, no one really knows what's going on. I, Maybe you do. Um, but if so, please enlighten me. But it, it just feels like there's a, a moment right now where a lot of the kind of conventional wisdom about what is possible and impossible to do with yeah. technology has 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 gone by the wayside, and we're just kind of discovering this this new world. And and what a fascinating time to be covering not just AI but but tech in general as it touches so many other things. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons why I was excited to have you on the the podcast is I think that what you're doing and what your colleagues are doing right now in journalism is a pretty important thing uh, in this moment when so many things are in flux. And I, I really do believe that that the technologies of AI are a going to do nothing but get more capable over time and B have really profound impacts on society. And 
you know, it's sort of a very important thing, I think, for society right now to like have uh, real high quality information about what's going on uh, and not just what I'm telling folks. Right. Like it, it requires you know, like, like I, I, I try very hard to, you know, like I, I'm, I mean, we, we've sort of talked on your podcast about what my motivation and mission is in doing all of this stuff, which is, you know, to try to build tools that are empowering people like the ones in my small community that I grew up in. But, you know, I'm also like, only one point of view uh on all of this and like we we need lots of people to come to their own opinions about what's going on and how things are being used and where they want it steered uh so i i i don't you know i'm, I'm guessing part of what you're doing is genuine curiosity and fascination with what's going on but the other part is like you know it does seem like there's a mission here that's important yeah, absolutely i mean i'd be lying if i said i was just reporting on this stuff out of pure enthusiasm and curiosity. Like I do also think that the media performs a valuable role in holding institutions and individuals accountable. Um, we are building some of the most, we, I say we, I mean you essentially and, and your peers in the tech industry are building some of the most powerful technology ever created. And I think without the media, there, there just wouldn't be a kind of, countervailing sort of I don't know I don't know if it's you know a, a force on the the minds of the people building that technology or just a caution around the technology um, but I'll, I'll give you an example of what I mean so you know you and I had this uh, this now infamous encounter back in February where yeah. you guys had just released Bing with this you know what we now know as GPT-4 running inside of it and I yep. had this insane conversation with Bing Chat, aka Sydney, uh, please don't hurt me, Sydney. Um, and, uh, you know, went on the front page, went totally viral, blew up, I'm sure, you know, your inbox, my inbox, everyone's inbox for, for everybody's, months. Everybody's and, inbox. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and subsequent to that, like, I, I started hearing from, you know, just in a nutshell, if people aren't familiar, it was it was a, a conversation that sort of lasted two hours in which Bing slash Sydney, you know, uh, confessed all these sort of dark secrets and tried to break up my marriage and it was it was insane and and subsequent to that story running i got notes from a lot of other people at tech companies saying you know how do we prevent our technology from doing that or even i even uh, got a, a a leaked uh, document from another big tech company which had a sort of roadmap for their ai product and listed on the roadmap was like do not break up Kevin Roos's marriage. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I really think that like that, and not to toot my own horn, this could have been anyone, but it 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 did really like serve yeah. as a cautionary tale for other companies that are building similar technology. And so I think that is what the media can and should do in moments of societal transformation and change is really hold a, a you know a hold up a sign that basically tells people like you know, you, you, you want to do this right. Or, yeah. you know, there will be, you know, there may be consequences for that. Yeah. And I think that is one of the very good things that came out of that experience. And, it, you know, it, I, it also, I think is, uh, it's another important reason why it is, I think you actually want to launch these things, uh, you know, even if it results in something that uh, floods your inbox, uh, you know, for a while is like, you just sort of get the societal level conversation about, you know, what's possible, what's going on, like, where's the line, like, what's good, what's bad. I mean, we, we haven't chatted uh, since that story published. Um, and, and one thing that I will say is like, I deeply appreciate the part of the writing that you did where you published the full transcript of the conversation. So like at that, that level of transparency, like it, it just wasn't confusing to anyone about, you know, like what inputs into the system led to like the things that it gave back. And like, that was super good. I, I don't think many of the people who were coming into my inbox had read the full transcript. Uh, but I, I think the, that that you're just a hundred percent spot on like the existence of this thing has like helped uh helped a lot of people like just make sure that they're paying real attention to you know to some very important things um 
and and also you know some of the stuff is fuzzy right like you know what where the line is and like part of what you are you all are helping doing is making sure that the public is paying enough attention to it so they can weigh in and have an opinion about where the line should be absolutely i mean it is um it is an area where I think more public opinion is is good. And um, right now, the, the number of people who are actually building this technology is, is like quite small relative to the, the number of people who are using it or who will soon be using it. And so yeah. I just think like the more people know about what's going on, the better. And, um, and, and I think it'll ultimately be good for the tech industry to have that kind of feedback, even if it is annoying and blows up your inbox in the moment. Yeah, I, and and... Right, for for what it's worth, it, it was like I was never uh, never annoyed about that. I was sometimes you were annoyed. remarkably chill. I you know I was I was um I was pleasantly surprised by <laughs> by like the you know the the response that you know you and I talked after I had had this conversation, but before I sort of published my story. Yeah. And, you know, you didn't freak out. You didn't accuse me of lying. You know, it was it was um a remarkably civil uh, conversation, and I I just I have appreciated that because that's not, and I'm not just blowing smoke here. Like that is, that is not the reaction that I expected, you know, given how <laughs> these things can go with other, uh, with other tech leaders. So I guess I'm just, I'm hopeful that the response to that article has not, the lesson from that has not been that we should build in secret and should never let no, anyone no, no, try no, our no, stuff. No, 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 no. I, I hope that it is like been sort of salutary for the whole um, project of building good and safe and responsible AI to like have some feedback along the way. 100%. Uh, like I don't, I don't think anybody was, I, I like, I'm genuinely trying to think if anyone was irritated. It's like, everybody is sort of like, okay, this is good lesson learned. And like, you know, we have a whole bunch of mechanism for, uh, you know, preventing things like that from happening again. And uh, I mean, it's just, just, it's, it's all good. Like, um, Somebody said to me at some point that, uh, like all feedback is a gift. Like the fact that you spent two hours, uh, trying very hard to get this thing to do uh, unusual things it, it, and then publish the whole transcript, uh, and then wrote this article that helps people pay more attention to the importance of responsible AI. Like all of that's a gift. Uh, like, and that's the way you should just sort of look at it. Yeah. I'll, I'll remind, uh, you know, tech executives of that. The next time I, I get an angry call from a comms department, you know, Kevin Scott <laughs> thinks feedback is a gift. So maybe you guys should get on board with that. Uh, I did also hear that you guys had Sydney swag made and I'm a little offended that none of that has shown up in my house. Did you hear that th about the beer? So this was my, my favorite thing that came out of that article was that a, there was a brewery in Minneapolis that, that came out with a beer called Sydney Loves Kevin. And yes. I have not tried it yet. Um, I, I heard it was good, but uh, you know, maybe you and I can get a pint, pint of it sometime. We, we, we should absolutely make a road trip to Minnesota <laughs> to get a pint. That would, that would be hilarious. Uh, um, yeah, I, somebody sent me that article, uh, or like a post mentioning that I, I think the week after, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and it was like the most, like I, I laughed so hard. I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing that I ask everyone on this podcast is, uh, like, I know you're probably busier now than you have ever been in your life, given the thing you're covering and how, uh, how much is going on in AI right now. Um, but I'm curious to know what you do outside of work uh, for fun. I have a one and a half year old. Um, oh, so he so keeps me pretty nothing. busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I change diapers, I install car seats. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I clean the, the, the toys that he throws around on the floor. Um, it is, it is a full-time job. So that yeah. is my, my main extracurricular hobby right now is, uh, hanging out with my son. So my, my kids are 13 and 15, uh, now. And, uh, like the thing that I can tell you is it gets, uh, it gets an awful lot better soon. Uh, and it's hard to imagine. I, I'm having a great time. Um, and uh, people say it's it exhausting, keeps getting better, though, right? I, I, I haven't experienced it as I mean, it's it's definitely like 
labor intensive and time intensive, but it, it's actually like it's it's the opposite of it's rejuvenating for me. It's like all awesome. I want to do at the end of a long work day is is uh, hang out with my kids. So I don't know if that makes me weird, but that's uh, that's how I feel. No, it, that that is, that is another inspiring thing. So I think we will uh, we will end it there, and I will let you uh, I'll let you get to your one and a half year old. Um, so thanks, Kevin. Thank you so much for being on today. This was a great conversation. Great to talk to you. All right. That was such a great conversation with Kevin Roos. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about, I think, the towards the end of the conversation, we were talking a little bit about the article that, that Kevin wrote around um, Sydney, which, as you mentioned at the top of the show, one of the most uh, read articles in New York Times history, um, according to people that you've talked to. I believe it. I saw it everywhere. I was actually... I think I was in Disney World when that article went up and I was just mesmerized. And I was like, okay, this is incredible. I mean, it li literally took me out of my vacation to read. So good job there, Kevin Roos. Um, but, uh, you know, there was, I think, a lot of concern from some people in the technology community when that article went out that this might be have, have like a dampening effect on uh, this generative AI uh, boom that we've been seeing. That obviously didn't happen. But I wanted to get your perspective. Why were you so open to having a conversation about what this was, being transparent about this is, you know, what happens when the, the token limit is, is exceeded and what can happen? Why was that important for you to have that conversation publicly and, and so um you know, soon as it happened, uh, when I'm going to be honest with you, being a former journalist um, and working with a lot of PR people, that's usually not the common PR response to something like this. <laughs> well, so there was there was an interesting technical thing that was going on uh, that I think was important for people to understand. Um, you know, so the way that these systems work is. They basically are just very complicated uh, engines for predicting the next word. Um, and so when they get to a point where the, the thing that is being predicted next uh, has a whole bunch of equiprobable outcomes, it just picks one. Um, and if all of those probabilities are very low, so like in any sort of next thing that's coming is like relatively unlikely, uh, like that is how you get these quote unquote hallucinations that people are talking about. And right. so if you have a very long and very unusual conversation with one of these systems, like it's not that hard at all to get it to hallucinate uh, and, you know, say you know, pretty outrageous things. And so... Right. It was it was learning for us uh, and like, you know, lear learning that was not a bad thing to have in public that, OK, we we never intended for people to have super long, uh, like super unusual conversations with being chat. Uh, and now we know that they are like we're going to go engineer the system where it won't produce uh, some of these outrageous things. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is, I do think that, you know, as uh, provocative as that conversation was, it um, had a whole bunch of stuff in it where, you know, if the nature of the conversation was like, hey, you know, Bing Chad, I would like you to write me a science fiction story or like a piece of fiction. Like if it was hallucinating inside of that context, it would be completely acceptable. Uh, but if someone were sitting in this chat agent, like having a sincere conversation uh, with the system where they thought all of this was real, um, you know, then like it's something different. And so like it was a really useful conversation to be having. And, and like I think a framework for com lots of conversations that we're going to have like this in the future where we're going to have to collectively decide together like what is okay and what is not okay in these systems because it's kind of difficult for us to figure out what users' expectations are of a brand new technology if they've never interacted with it. Um, and, and so like that's sort of the choices that we're making right now. It's like we're going to let you interact with it. And there's some things that we're doing where like they're just bright lines and like we're not going to let you use it to do things that we like and, and everybody else can clearly understand are like very sure. serious, like obvious harms. And then they're going right. to be a whole bunch of gray zone things where 
the only way that we're going to figure out what people want is to like let them use the product and sometimes totally. that means like it's going to do something they don't want and they're going to have to tell us about it and i think that's okay no, I totally agree. And I think everything you said is, is spot on. Um, and I, I do want to actually applaud you just for having that, I think, foresight to say that, yes, these are conversations we need to have and we should probably have them earlier uh, rather than later. Um, you know, I continue to be floored by just how quickly everything has moved in the last, you know, uh, nine, 10 months. And the fact that, you know, the article came out what, February? And, and here we are in August as we're recording this. And, uh, you know, it feels like a lifetime ago just in terms of how much the tech has changed. Um, so yeah. I, I, I applaud you, I think, for uh, responding the way that you did. Um, and also, Kevin, for, you know, including the entire transcript, as he did, as you pointed out, that was great journalism, because I think that helped shape the conversation that we've continued to have over the last year, as the technology has only, you know, uh, increased uh, adoption and um, evolved as, as more uh, people are doing more things. Yeah, I, th I think there's this other thing, too, where um, we, we sometimes lose this bit of um, nuance or perspective uh, today, but mm -hmm. it, it's entirely possible for like two two people or two organizations or two institutions operating in good faith to like have hard conversations with one another and it not totally. be the end of the world. And the objective exactly. ought not to be, let us never have these hard conversations. Like that's kind of nutty. Um, and so in a sense, like if I zoom all the way back out, I think that as long as everybody's operating in good faith, uh, like let us have the, let us have the hard conversations. Um, and, and like even encourage them, please. No, I, th I think you're exactly right. Uh, and uh, have the hard conversations. Listen to Kevin Roos's podcast, Hard Fork. I'm going to give him a plug there. And on that note, thank you so much um, for uh, joining us. That's going to be all the time we have for today. Huge thanks again to Kevin Roos of the New York Times for joining us. Uh, great to great to see him and, and hear from him. If you have anything that you'd like to share with us, please email us anytime behind the tech at Microsoft.com. You can also follow Behind the Tech on your favorite podcast platform, and you can check out our full video episodes on YouTube. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.